Okay. Uh, Micah chapter 7, verses 14 to 20. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest, in fertile pasture lands. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. Nations will see and be ashamed, deprived of all their power. They will put their hands over their mouths and their ears will become deaf. They will lick dust like a snake, like creatures that crawl on the ground. They will come trembling out of their dens. They will turn in fear to the Lord our God and will be afraid of you. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You did not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. And our New Testament Bible reading is Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 23. Uh, that's page 954 in the Church Bibles. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 23. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, Strengthen in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumph triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with the idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teaching. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence.
Thanks, Andrew. Keep your Bible open there to Colossians 2, and I'll pray for us. Father, what a joy it is to meet together, to be able to pray together, to sing your praises, uh, to be able to hear your word read. And we pray now that you'd help us to understand it so that we can live as the people of God who have fullness in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you like bubble gum? Do you? I love bubble gum. I remember as a kid, I used to um, save up my pocket money and go down to the shops and get some bubble gum. It was Hubba Bubba back then. They had all different flavors. And um, I used to chew this stuff like there was no tomorrow. In fact, I got to a, a point where my jaw would, would get sore from all the chewing. Um, and, mmm, strawberry. Oh, wow. It, this is bringing me back. This is wonderful. It's so sweet. It's soft. It's sticky. And it just oozes with goodness. And I would love to get to a point, I can't talk, where I would just chew it and get a big bubble. I don't think I can do it now. I'm not chewing enough. Plus, it might get on the microphone, and it'd get to a big, big bubble and just pop all over my face. I would love doing that. And I would sometimes chew this to a point, actually, where it would turn into liquid. I got my money's worth out of this chewing gum. But um, I want to use bubble gum as an analogy this morning. I'll take this out because mm, it's so good. Chewing gum, bubble gum, is an image. It looks good, it tastes good, it's great. But what happens when you swallow it? I did on occasion. And you feel full, but actually it's so bad for you. It doesn't do you any good. It, it, it tastes good, it looks good, you enjoy it, but in the end it's just pop and nothing else. It doesn't do anything for you. There's no nutritional value. And I want you to see that in this passage this morning. I want you to see that in Jesus Christ, you've got everything. You've got the fullness and everything else is just bubble gum. Look at, we saw it last week actually in chapter 2 verse 3, um, where it says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's the image of a treasure chest. You know, when you get that treasure chest and it opens up and you look inside and all the light just hits your face and inside are all the riches and the goodness and everything is there. All the wisdom, all the knowledge is in Jesus Christ. You don't find it anywhere else. All the wealth is in him. Everything else is bubblegum. It's all pop and it does nothing for you. Um, and maybe you're here this morning and you're tempted to move away from Christ and find something somewhere else. Or maybe you're here this morning and you haven't yet come to Christ and you need to know that in him is everything that you actually absolutely need. And so what we're going to see this morning from this passage in Colossians 2 is we're going to see three things. We're going to see, first of all, the application. We're going to start with the application of this passage, and then we're going to see the way of bubblegum, and then the way of deep, deep fullness. Okay? Let's start with the application. The application is um, what was so um, beautifully uh, seen in the children's talk, and, and it's, it's to continue where you started. Look at verse uh, chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6, it says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So then, so then, so then. You've, you've heard that it's all about Jesus. You've heard already that he's the king of creation. He's the king of new creation. He's the one who made all things and all things are made by him and for him. 
And you've heard Paul say that he agonizes over preaching over Jesus and his big goal is to present everyone perfect in Christ. You've heard all that. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, that word received, by the way, means handing down a body of teaching to someone. Have you had the truth of Jesus handed down to you? Is that you this morning? So then, continue in him. Continue to live your life in him. You've, you've received him. You've put your trust in him. You've asked him to command you. Now, keep going the same way that you've started. That's the application. Stay with him. Stick with him. Don't move away from him. And there's two images that he gives to help us understand um, how, what to do with this. Um, it's the image of a tree and the image of a building. Verse 7, do you see that? Rooted and built up in him. Grow deep and grow high. Okay, it's the image of a tree. You know, the, the tree, it needs to dig down its roots to grow deep and to be strong and to be stable and get its nutrients from the ground. And so too, we are to grow down deep into Christ and draw our strength from him. And he is the one that we go to for our strength and energy. But it's the image of a building. We grow up in him as we're constructed in him. As we're built up in Christ, he is the one we build ourselves up into. We grow down and we build up. We stay where we are. Trees and buildings don't move. <laughs> they don't move. Now, this is for anybody who's been a Christian for 10 days. This is for anybody who's been a Christian for 10 years. Stay with Christ. Stick with him. Are you someone who is growing in Christ? Are you drawing from Christ? Are you growing up in him? I want you to do something today. I want you to resolve that you will grow up in Christ. That you will resolve to say, I'm not going to stay a baby Christian. There's too many baby Christians. And you need to say, I'm not going to stay a baby Christian. I'm not going to stay a toddler Christian. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to grow up into maturity. I'm going to be an adult Christian. I'm going to be mature. I'm go That's what I'm going to do. Um, just as I started with Christ, I'm going to continue with him. I'm not going to graduate from Jesus. I'm going to stick with the discipleship school of Jesus Christ. I'm going to grow and be stronger and wiser. I'm going to stick with him. That's the challenge. Do you see the application from this passage? Has everyone got it? Okay, that's the application. Now, um, what we're going to see next is, uh, is the reasons for doing this. And um, I'm going to start with um, the way of bubblegum. Okay, the way of bubblegum is the way of emptiness. It really comes from verse 8. Look at verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul gives a reason to stick with Christ. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. It, see, he talks about being taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy, things that are empty. Things that they look good, they promise much, but in the end, it's just like bubble gum. It has all bubble, and but once you pop it, it's gone. It'll take you captive. He's saying, don't get abducted. Don't get kidnapped by empty lies. And it could be that there were um, false teachers coming into Colossae, and they were saying things like, oh, have you, you've heard about Jesus. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, let me tell you about the real fullness that you can have. Let me help you get closer to God. Now, friends, any teaching that says that you can have more than Jesus, that something other than Jesus will get you closer to God, well, that, my friends, is false teaching. 
And you need to be aware of it, and it will lead you away from Christ, and that's why it's empty. That's why it's bubblegum. It will take you away from the real treasure. It will take you away from the real riches. Any alternative to Christ is hollow. It's deceptive. And Paul says, I don't want you to be kidnapped by these things. And so what he does is he gives us three examples of this hollow and deceptive philosophies. Uh, and they're based on human teachings. He says they're based on spiritual forces even. These are, if you have the ears to hear this, these, these are demonic. And he says, these things will take you away from Christ. Now, I've got to say at the start that these things um, aren't all bad in and of themselves, but it's the reason why you do these things that counts. Okay, the first one, I'll tell you what they are, first of all. They're religious practice, religious experience, and religious rules. Again, there's nothing wrong with these things in and of themselves, but when you do these things to get you closer to Christ, closer to God, it's, it's not good. Be warned. Verse 16, religious practice. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Now, it could be that there were Jewish people who were saying to the Colossians, you have Christ? Ah, oh, that's great, but you need to eat the right food. You need to keep the, the Sabbath day. You need to celebrate the Passover. You need to eat this, keep this day. And religious people love special days, don't they? They love special food. They love um, special things that they can do because they, they can think that by doing these things, it brings us closer to God. But in the end, if that's the way you think, it's bubblegum. Because it doesn't get us any closer to God. I remember as a young Christian thinking this. I remember thinking that Sunday was the Sabbath. I thought church was the temple. I thought Old Testament laws were New Testament obedience. But it's only a shadow. Look at verse 17. These are, he's talking about the Old Testament laws, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. See, the law was a shadow. Christ was the reality. The law predicted Christ, pointed to Christ, paved the way to Christ, but the law was not Christ. Christ is the reality. When the reality is here, why do you focus on the shadow? You know, there have been times in my marriage where um, Christy and I have had to rely upon the shadow. By that I mean, you know, we've been um, not in each other's presence. There might be a conference or an overseas trip or something on which me means we're not in the same place. And so we've had to rely upon the shadow, FaceTime, to communicate. You know, what a, what a poor substitute FaceTime is. You know, you're looking at a screen and you're communicating with each other. I mean, it, it's, it's good for the time, isn't it? Because it's making you connected but it's reminding you of the time when you'll be back together, of the reality. What would it be like if I, um, we got back together in each other's presence and I said to Christy, hey, Christy, do you mind just going in the other room and we'll pull out our phones and we'll FaceTime with each other? What do you think she'd say? Now, she's a very gracious woman, by the way. Please know that. But why do you focus upon the shadow when you've got the reality, it just doesn't make sense. That's what Paul's saying. Why do you focus upon the shadow when you've got Jesus Christ here? The reality is found in the person of Jesus Christ, religious practice. But the second thing he talks about is religious experience. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. It says, Do not let anyone who delights... And false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about, notice this, what they have seen. And they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Okay, it could be that mystics were saying, you've got Jesus, but have you seen this? Have you heard this? Have you had this experience? Do you worship this angel? Do you... 
Have you seen this vision? Because I've seen it. Do you speak in tongues? I do. Have you got this special anointing? I've got it. And you can have it too. If you come to me and give me a million dollars, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that people were saying. That's the kind of thing people say today. Give us money and you'll be blessed and you can have it too. You know, you should come away on this retreat with me or you should read this special book, have this special teaching that no one else has. You can't find it anywhere else. It's all in this book. And you can be blessed and get cl as close to God as I am. Friends, it's all bubblegum. It's all chasing after an experience. Uh, again, friends, there's nothing wrong with experiences. I love experiences. But don't think that your experience will get you any closer to God. Uh, the people that talk about these things, it's usually all about them. It's usually all about their experience. And, th and that's why they're puffed up. They're proud. But it's, it's false humility. It's empty. Why? Look at verse 19. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. See, what does this do? It actually takes you away from the head. It takes you away from your life in Christ. It takes you away from Christ. And you need to hold on to him, not hold on to your experiences. And the final way to be empty is by religious rules. Do you see verse 20? Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. See, they're submitting to man-made rules which say, don't touch this, don't eat this, don't have this meat, don't drink this alcohol, don't do any of this. And you realise... All through the history of the church, there have been people who have done this. There have been people who have lived for years and years out in the desert. There have been people who have lived up on, on poles um, for, for years. There have been people who have gone without food to the point of forcing their body through malnourishment. There have been people who have you know, gone through life whipping themselves. There have been people who have worn itchy undergarments under their clothes because it makes them feel uncomfortable <laughs> why do they do why would you do that because it makes you feel superior than anybody else oh no one else is doing this i'm going through this rule and no one else is doing what i'm doing it's all self-imposed because they think by doing these things it will bring them closer to god but it's all bubblegum it promises much, but it delivers nothing. It promises self-control. It promises to get you closer to God, but it, it, it gives you no help. It gives you no assistance. All it gives you is the rule, the regulation. And it, it's tricky because it, it's deceptive because you do these things and you think, wow, this actually, I feel good about myself, don't I, doing this? It actually, I, I'm doing something. I'm contributing something. God must look at me. He must be proud of me, the discomfort that I'm putting myself through. It, it, it actually feeds into our thinking to make us think, I can get closer to God by doing this. But in the end, it's just rules. It's just human religion. And again, let me say, there's, there's nothing wrong with keeping rules and having religious experiences and practicing religion. But if you do these things to think it will bring you closer to God, it's bubblegum. Because in the end, they don't deliver. It, you know, it, it promises reality, but it only gives you the shadow of the reality. It promises you experience, but in the end, it only cuts you off from Christ. It promises self-control, 
but it gives you no assistance, only rules and regulations. It's all emptiness, and Paul wants us to see it. It's as though we prefer to sit down to a meal of bubblegum when God wants to give us a big feast. Because do you realize in Christ we have it all? We have all the riches, all the wisdom, all the knowledge. It's all found in him. So continue where we start. And so that's why Paul wants to go on to tell us about the final thing, the way of fullness. Let me tell you about the way of fullness. Because did you notice that in this passage, Paul focuses on Jesus? You know, the words in Christ are like a red ribbon running through this passage. That idea of in Christ in Christ, with Christ. It's all here in this passage. Verse 10, in him. Verse 11, in whom. Verse 12, with him. Verse 12 again, in whom. Verse 13, with him. And verse 15, in him. It's, it's, see, it's all about Jesus. Why shouldn't you be taken captive by these things, well, because verse 9, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Oh, if you've got your own Bible, colour in this verse, highlight this verse, memorise this verse. In Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in body, bodily form. This is a great Christmas verse, isn't it? That in all that God is, Jesus is. All that God is lives in the body of Jesus. The very stuff of God, the very substance of God is in Jesus. Jesus is God in human skin. Do, do you see this? You don't get any more of God than what you get in Jesus. And now look at verse 10. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Do you see the, the thing Paul's saying here? Do you see the, the argument? Jesus Christ is fully God, and you've been given all this fullness, if you have Jesus. Because Jesus is fully God, and if you have Jesus, then you have all of God. You're as close to God as you can get, if you have Jesus. If you are in Christ... You have everything that there is to have. There's nothing more of God to be had outside of Christ. Are you hearing me? You can't get any closer to God other than in Christ Jesus. You can't get any closer to God if you tried. Um, if you try, in fact, you won't get closer. It'll take you away. But if you are in him, then you have all the fullness. You don't need religious practice or to have a religious experience or to have religious rules to get you closer to God. That's bubblegum. Because it, you're already there. That's what Paul's saying. You're already there. You've already got the fullness. And what Paul does is he gives us three areas where we have the fullness. What's the fullness that he's talking about? It's life, first of all. Life. Look at verse 11. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. See, Paul is not talking about physical circumcision. He's saying that if you are in Christ, you were spiritually circumcised. What does he mean? What he means is, he tells you in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. He's using circumcision to talk about the fact that you were buried and you were raised with Christ. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was raised, you were raised. Who died on that cross? You did. Who was buried? Who rose? You did. Why? Or because Jesus did. Now, more of this next week. We're going to focus on this teaching next week because it's so important to get right. But it's all because you are in Christ. You are alive because Jesus is alive. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. 
in Christ. You are alive now in Christ. You've got life. His life is now yours. You've got his life inside of you all because you are in Christ. You've got life. There's fullness for you. And there's also, um, oh, I haven't finished those next points. Let's, what's happened here? There we go. No, I didn't finish. The next one is, sorry, I have, obviously haven't finished that slide off the way I should have. The next point, the next point of fullness is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. See, the only way we can come to life is we have our sins forgiven. The charge of legal indebtedness, that IOU, that was against, opposed you, opposed against you, Jesus Christ has dealt with it. It's taken away. Think about a credit card statement. You know, you've got a credit card statement and you can't pay it off. The bills just keep piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up. It just gets higher and higher and then suddenly someone comes along, psh, pays it off. It's all gone, gone. It's dealt with. That's what Jesus Christ has done. He's come and he's paid off your bill. In fact, he's taken the bill and he's ripped it up. He's destroyed it. He's nailed it to the cross. He's blotted it out. It's, it's dealt with. It's erased from existence. He's wiped out your huge debt. He's wiped the slate clean. He's reformatted your hard drive. He's removed your criminal record. Whatever image works for you, understand that Jesus' death means that if you trust him, you are forgiven and you don't owe a thing. Isn't that fullness? Isn't that wonderful news? No one is able to bring up anything against you because Jesus Christ has paid for it all. You're forgiven. So stick with Christ, won't you? And then finally, the final picture of fullness here is in verse 15. It's victory. Victory. Look at verse 15. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know, in the days before Facebook, you know, the best way to announce something before the days of social media, it was, if you wanted to announce to the world that you've won the battle, you know what you would do? You would get the defeated enemy as disheveled and defeated as they look, and you would strip them naked, and you would march them out in the streets of your hometown and you would make an announcement that we've won the battle and the victory is ours and everyone would see the naked disheveled defeated enemy and they would know that victory is yours and that's what jesus christ has done on the cross he stripped the powers and authorities the devil in front of the whole world is stripped naked, as it were, to see that Christ has defeated them. You're on the winning side. So don't go and join the losing side. Stick with Christ. Do you see what Paul keeps saying? He keeps saying, stick with Christ. Jesus is all you need. Add anything to Jesus and you get e emptiness. Add something to Jesus and you get nothing. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. It's not as though Jesus builds the road partway to God and you've got to build the other half to get there yourself. No. You don't, you don't build the rest of the way with religion or rules or experience. No. Jesus gets you the full way. So stick with him. Walk with him. Continue where you started. Don't add anything to Jesus. Don't get abducted by anything else. Stick with Jesus. There's nowhere else to go. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this. He says, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. How can you tell if you believe this that we've been talking about this morning? How can you tell if you've, you are sticking with the fullness? Just as I finish, again, look at chapter 2, verse, verse 7. 
rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And what's that last phrase there? Overflowing with thankfulness. Do you believe this? Man, I was rebuked in my growth group this week as we looked at this. I thought, oh, I need to be more thankful. I need to be someone who's overflowing with thankfulness. I'm not thankful enough. And it rebuked me. And then, you know, God rebuked me and said, don't stay in that rebuke. Move out of there and be someone who's thankful. Don't stay grieved in your sin. Move out and, and know you've got the fullness. Be someone who's thankful. So can I encourage us this week? Be thankful, Christians. Be people who believe this and express that in, in someone who just overflows with thankfulness to God. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, we pray that you give us the strength to stick with Christ. Pray you'd help us to be know that we're complete in him, rooted and built up in him. Um, Father, help us to keep growing in him. May we never put our confidence in anything else. May we always put our confidence in Jesus Christ and stay with him. And we pray it in his name. Amen.